good day so far? Just started? Is anybody feeling low right now, low energy? Kind of? No? I have candy. Does anyone want candy? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay, here you go. Candy for everybody. Here, you want some candy? Here, here you can have a piece of candy. Candy for everyone. I've got lots more and I'll share it all with you, okay? Candy, <laughs> have some. I don't want to see anybody sleeping during the seminar, okay? No naps, not today. Okay, so we're gonna get started. I'm gonna talk about marketing today. Everyone excited? Kind of? Good. I'm gonna tell you how you should be spending your marketing budget. All right, so the, fir uh, the first few things I'm gonna be discussing with you very first thing, I'm going to explain a little bit about who I am, who's the crazy guy throwing candy at you. Okay? Then I'm going to cover some common marketing questions everybody's got. I'm going to go over the top, 12, or top 16 things that you should be doing for your office in order, as well as some mistakes everyone typically makes, FAQ questions, and then I'm going to cover a little bit about doctor marketing and then some cases, questions, and pricing and things like that. Okay? So just to explain a little bit about me, that's me. I've been the owner of Dr. Marketing since 2014, but I've, I've been in dental since 2008, working in both advertising and telecom. I've won a number of awards for the work that we've done over the last decade. Does anybody have any questions on my history? Pretty simple, right? Good. So common marketing questions. There are, there are typically five questions that come up whenever we start going down the path for marketing. First, everyone wants to know, how much money do you spend? Everyone wants to know, what's your budget? Second question they typically want to know is, how should I spend it? Specifically, where? Google, print, should I advertise on dating websites? How should I, how should I market my business? Then they want, to, they want to know, usually, who do I target? So once they kind of get the how, it's, all right, what does the ad really look like? Am I targeting men or women? Am I targeting a specific geography? Am I targeting people with kids? How am I going to be targeting them? Then. It's how do I rank higher on Google? And my personal favorite, what happens if I start marketing and then I don't generate anything? So I am going to cover all of these questions, but does anybody have any additional questions they were kind of hoping to get answers on? No? Perfect. So who the presentation is meant for? Basically, anybody who wants to learn about marketing. Doesn't matter if you're a startup, if you're a DSO, multi-location practice, if you are a specialist or a GP, it does not matter. We will help you with this information. Okay, and the things that you're gonna learn are about Google, social media, and print marketing, how marketing campaigns work, how to better optimize your website, and then how to set up a proper marketing budget. Now, the top, that, uh, top 16 things that you should be doing for your practice in order. The very first thing you want to take a look at are domains. Now there's two types of domains. The very first one are business name domains. That's like brandondentistry.com. That's how people who know you are able to find you. And then you've got keyword based domains. So let's say brandondentistry.com was taken. What am I going to do? I'm going to register maybe like familydentistinsanjose.com. Or I could register like dental implants in San Jose. Maybe it's something I'm passionate about, right? So a keyword-based domain is exactly that. It's something typically tied to a service location or industry. Just be aware a lot of your competitors do keyword-based domains. So if they own San Jose Family Dentist, do not, own, do not register San Jose Family Dentistry. Okay? So you have to make sure you're doing some due diligence if you go after a keyword-based domain to make sure you don't have anything that's too similar to somebody else. Now, when you do register a, a business name domain, you want to register multiple suffixes. A suffix is the ending of a domain. That's like .com, .net, .biz, .dental, .io, .au, .in. Like there's tens of thousands of different endings that you could have for a domain. And so there's only five that are most recognized in, in the United States. .com, .net, .biz, .info, and .org. If you showed your business name, brandondentistry.com, .net, biz, info, org, ca, com, like I -N -A -U, if you showed every single one of them to the average person, they would only click on those five. Com, net, biz, info, org. So those are the five that you want to register. Simply it protects your name. Too many times I've run into a scenario where you register brandondentistry.com, 
do not register the other ones and somebody else in another country registers brandondentistry.net. Somebody else registers brandondentistry.org. So you want to register just those type, top five suffixes. Now, when it's a keyword-based domain, you don't have to do that. So if you're registering San Jose Family Dental or like dental implants in San Jose or Invisalign in San Jose, you don't have to register all the different suffixes. That's not your business name. There's nothing there to protect. You just have to register the one, no one domain and you're good. Now, for keyword-based domains, do not register multiple domains just for the sake of owning them. They do nothing for your optimization. They are a waste of money. Google does not care. The only thing Google cares about, there's a domain, there's a website attached to it. Every other forwarded domain does zero for search engine optimization, so don't waste your money registering multiple domains. The only reason I'm suggesting you do it for your business name is because it protects your identity. Now, anytime you register a domain, your information becomes public knowledge, which means if I was a spammer, I would simply just go online, type in your domain, scrape all your contact information, and sell it to 1,000 people to spam the hell out of you until the end of time. So to prevent that from happening, we basically want to redact all of your personal information online by adding a security blanket to the domain. When you do that, it redacts everything, phone, uh, fax, email, address, business name, address, everything. Now, typical domains can cost anywhere from $15 to $30 per year, depending on the suffix. Security blankets are anywhere from $5 to $20 per domain. So you can get a domain with security per year for $40 to $60. Bucks. Like, it's not expensive to run these things. Okay. Now, I know some of you might have questions throughout. We have an hour. Usually this presentation is done in two hours. So I'm going to speed through. If you have questions, please write them down, and I'll be at the back to answer any questions you might have, OK? Next are emails. So by show of hands, how many people know that their email is HIPAA compliant? One person. So how many of you have a Gmail, Hotmail, uh, yeah, uh, MSN, AOL, Outlook? How many of you have an email like that? like an at gmail.com or at outlook.com. Those emails are not HIPAA compliant, okay? And fun fact, when you email someone, 70% of the time the incoming mail server picks it up and says it's spam, 70% of the time. And it's not because of something you did and it's not because of something the patient did. That's how free email accounts work. A spammer sets up an email, spams 1,000 people, sets up an email, spams 1,000 people. So when an incoming mail server picks it up, they automatically assume your spam and go straight to the spam box. This is why if you ever get a web form or a chatbot lead and you email it back, why the patient doesn't respond, it's because they're not getting the message. Pick up the phone and call the patient when you get a lead, okay? Now, with custom emails, it's only 12% because these are paid email accounts. So you are paying to create an email account so incoming mail servers treat them with more respect. And they, might, they look much more professional. What email are you more likely to reply to? Dentaltemp101 at gmail.com when you're asking for medical records or info at Coulter's Mill Dental? Probably the info one, right? Plus, you can actually take the, the suffix, hang on, there we go. You can take the suffix, ha, populate, populate it into Google, and it can populate your website. But you can't do that from a Gmail account. So you, you should be setting up a custom email. It looks much more professional, it's much more secure, and it goes into the inbox much more. Plus, they're HIPAA compliant, as long as you have a proper provider. Typically, the two best providers are Google's G Suite program or Microsoft Office 365. Okay? Now, medical grade emails want to have some of these additional services on it. First is data backup. If you accidentally delete something, you can restore it. Malware protection helps fight against viruses. So if you get an email with a virus in it, the virus stays in the email and doesn't migrate it to the inbox. Anti-phishing software does in the top right corner, but it works for you, or top left corner, but it works for you. Which means if you get an email from a known spammer, that email goes to your spam box and not your inbox. Email encryption is the password protected uh, HIPAA compliance that you need. So if you are sending and receiving medical records, you need to password protect it. So if I send you a message and I encrypt it, it you're gonna get a message saying, hey, Brandon sent you a message, you know, please, please log in. So you're going to have to log into a secure server, put in your username and password, get access to it, reply to it. Then I'm going to get a message saying you replied. I have to then log into the secure server, be able to reply, and that's how, that's how HIPAA compliance works. If you were just simply scheduling messages, you do not need to encrypt every single message to confirm like appointments and things like that, only if it's medical information. Desktop and mobile integration means if you read and reply to it on your desktop, it's also read and replied to on your phone. 
50 gigs of storage is enough for about 100, or 250,000 emails, standard emails. If you're sending and receiving medical records, it's about 40,000, okay? So we always recommend at least 50 gigs of storage because sometimes you have multiple front desk people that are sending out lots of emails back and forth, so it can fill up within a few years. Now, after the emails, the website. So how many people have a website for their office? Come on, everyone should put up their hand. Everyone has a website, right? How websites have been done over the last 30 years is that the website design company basically builds a server, designs websites for that server, and then sells them to you. And then they say, you know what? I want to make more money. So instead of upgrading the server, what they typically do is they build a second server with better websites and better technology. And you pay to upgrade to it. And then six months later, they build better servers with better websites and better technology. And again, you pay to upgrade to it. And if you don't pay to upgrade to it, what ends up happening is that when people try to engage with your website, it doesn't properly load. Or a widget's broken. Or a security license isn't there. Or, oops, 404 page error, there's a link that's broken. And this is very, very common with how websites have been designed over the last 30 years. Okay? How websites have been done nowadays, that is, it, well, like with professional companies, is that you should be updating the server. So when we introduce new technology, we automatically put it on the server, which means it goes out to everyone. That's how website design companies, professional ones, should be working, and that's how we work. So there are three parts to a website. You have the design, which is basically how the website is structured. Where does the logo go? Where do the nav navigation tabs go? Where does the content go? Then you've got the content, which is basically the images, videos, and verbiage on the actual site itself. You and I could literally hop on a call, build a whole website in two days, 50 to 60 pages. Done. Two days. It's not complicated to, act, to actually put it together and to create it. The complicated part, the biggest pain in the ass, is the technology that's used to build it. The main reason is because if I, let's say, click on this button and that button doesn't work, that could have cascading effect of failures across the entire website. Where does the, if I click on the image, does the image go to the home page? If I click on the chat bot, does it properly come up? That's the technology used to build the website. The technology can take you know, sometimes a couple of weeks, depending on the complexity of the site, to sometimes a couple of months, depending on the features that you want enabled. Okay? So when you are designing a website, just keep a few things in mind. First, simple is better. Don't jam pack it full of random content and pictures and videos. Make sure that it's got a proper flow. So simple. Next, you want to review it on a consistent basis. Simply add it to your calendar of list of things to do. Click on every page of your website. Like every three months, six months, whatever your timeline is, review every page of content on your website. Then you want to test the features. So you want to test the links. You want to make sure that the links are working. You want to make sure that they're, if you're linking to an external source, does the external source still even exist? Test your website. And if you find things that need to be done, you want to make sure you're doing updates to them. Okay? Either you do them or your marketing company or your website design company does them for you. Okay? That's how website design should be done and tested and worked with on an ongoing basis. Now, now that your website's, optimi or, or your website's built, you're ready to go, you want to optimize it. Now, there's two types of optimization. First is static. Next is dynamic. Static keywords are built on your website and they're built per page. I have a page about root canals, I've got a page about emergencies, I've got a page about implants. There are specific keywords attached to each individual page. That's how Google's able to know what page to show up uh, on, on its search results. So if somebody goes and wants to find root canals, attached to the root canal page of your site, there's going to be root canal treatment. There's going to be sensitive to hot and cold. Under the emergency, it's going to be chipped tooth, cracked tooth, emergency dentist, bleeding gums. Stuff like that. You're all with me so far? Okay. Dynamic optimization is added to the static, which means if I had a keyword like emergency dentist, emergency dentist is static, but emergency dentist near me, near me is the dynamic combination. So emergency dentist open now, emergency dentist open weekends, child emergency dentist, female emergency dentist, emergency dentist who speaks Spanish. So any static keyword, one static keyword could have five to as many as a hundred different dynamic combinations attached to a single static keyword, okay? And that is why dynamic optimization is typically a paid service because you're, you're usually adding hundreds or sometimes thousands of keywords to a website all with different combinations. Now, to understand this a little bit better, 
you want to make sure that the keywords are page specific. So on the emergency page, I'm not going to add keywords for, let's say, lost tooth. I might, but I might just include the content. Where I'm going to include lost tooth might be under a dental implant page. So somebody goes online and types in lost tooth, what do I do? Under the implant page, it says, lost your tooth, we can help. Here's content, and then here's how we fix it. Okay, so you've got to make sure that the keywords are attached to the correct page of your site. It's going to make sure that the conversion actually happens because the patient is finding what they need right away. Next, you want to check your rank. So Google provides a system called Google Search Console. It's a free system they provide that basically scans your website, scans their analytics, and says, hey, here's a list of all the keywords that you show up for and how you rank for every single keyword. Very simple system called Google Search Console, okay? Then what you want to do is you want to add more content for those specific words. So if, let's just say on Google Search Console, there's a thousand keywords that you show up for, what are you supposed to be adding content around? Well, Google on that system provides clicks, impressions, and rank. So you can see what your top ranking keywords are for that, and then what you do is you take your top ranking keywords and put more content on your website about that. So where do you put that content? Put it on a blog. I'm sure all of you know what a blog is, but most of you, I'm sure, don't know the intricacies of how it works. So first thing you want to do is you want to build out your blog backend. So what is the blog going to be about? You're going to tell Google, you're going to tell the viewers what the blog is actually going to be written about. Dental education, right? Like uh, uh, what procedures are, right? Emergency treatments, things like that. Then what you want to do is you want to look at the analytics that Google provides in Google Search Console and you want to categorize every single keyword. So like these are all the keywords for implants, these are all the keywords for root canals, these are all the keywords for emergencies. Then what you want to do is you want to research content around those groups of keywords and then build content for it and then put it on your site. It's basically that simple. Now you do have to keep a few things in mind when building this. So you have to post consistently. So if you're not going to post consistently, hire someone to do it for you. Two to every, once every two to four weeks. By the end of the year, you'll have between 12 and 25 blogs. 50 plus keywords per blog post. So you could include all the list that Google gives you. So when we categorize those keywords from Google Search Console, we could add a few extra keywords onto it or make some, uh, make some uh, additions to those keywords and then add it to the content that we're developing. This way, Google's going to index all those keywords that they have plus all the new ones that you added. So instead of getting found for 1,000 keywords on Search Console, you're now found for 1,005 keywords on Search Console. More keywords means you show up more, which means more traffic and more patience and stuff like that. Then, limit your content to no more than 2,000 words. Attention span is what we're going for, people, okay? Too much content, you're gonna lose them, okay? 700 to 1,500 word is the sweet spot, no more than 2,000 words per page. And then custom images and videos. Don't just add a picture of someone's teeth, like, you know, put a, put a, put a filter over the picture, add your logo to the picture, right? Like, yeah, you, you do some Photoshop with a graphic designer. Create custom images for the content that you're writing about. Now, whether you do regular website content or you do a blog, there are some specific places that you need to optimize on your website. So one of those places is in the actual tab of the browser itself. So right up there, you can optimize. These are places that Google looks at, okay? Next are the UR, is the URL suffix. So after the .com or .ca or .net or .biz or whatever we go with, whatever's there are keywords. Next are the navigation tabs. So I'm sure all of you have Googled a business and then seen like home, about, services, contact. That's what that is. So make sure that it's not long, it's short, and that those navigation tabs are very easy for Google to understand. That way they're going to show them to people when, when people are, are, are searching. Next is the page header. Now, have any of you heard of something called an H1 header before? H1 header? Really? How many of you are doing marketing by a show of hands for your practice? One person? Two people? Nobody else is doing advertising for their office? Three? Okay. So an H1 header is one of the top 20 things that Google looks at. There's about 200 things. An H1 header is a top 20 item, which means they put more emphasis on that particular piece of information. So your title should read, because this is about bad breath, bad breath treatment in Victoria, BC. 
Okay, if it's about gum disease, what is gum disease? How can I treat it? Okay, so you have to make sure you're using keywords like that or, you know, bad breath treatment near me. You've got to be creative with the titles, but you also have to be short with it. Next is the page summary. This provides Google with a synopsis of what the page is ultimately going to be about. Then you have the content on the page. The content, the content on the page should be ranked according to how much traffic it generates. So if you've got a page about, uh, let, let's just say about emergencies, okay? On the emergency page, we're not going to put abscesses at the top because abscesses produces zero traffic. What we're gonna put at the top is maybe sleep apnea or we're gonna put chipped tooth or something like that. The stuff that gets a lot of traffic, that's what you're gonna put at the top of the page, stuff that generates no traffic towards the bottom. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna update the title and description. So on the back end of every single page of your website, Google picks up two pieces of data, the title and description. They take that and in the search results, they plug that information in right there. They don't modify it, they don't do anything, but they take it and they look for keywords and based on what the person typed in, they'll decide where you rank based on how relevant that title and description is, okay? So the title and description, top 20 item that Google looks at. And you have to manipulate this per page. So the root canal page, the title should say root canal treatment sensitive to hot and cold. You know, stop, uh, stop sensitivity to food, to hot and, beverage, hot and cold beverages. You know, look, you might need a root canal. Consider an emergency dental treatment call today, something like that. For implants, it's gonna be lost tooth, we can help, right? And the content is going to be specifically about, about dental implants. Emergencies about emergencies. Y'all with me so far? Good. Then you have to set up something called local business schema. This is about a page of code that you add to your website that helps maps find and navigate your business and present it to local searchers. So I'm sure all of you have at some point used the term near me in anything that you've done. So if you type in, you know, dentist near me, this local business schema is gonna help your business show up in the search results. Now I can promise you, not everybody has this enabled on their site. Okay, so you've gotta make sure that you enable something like this on your site to help Google Maps navigate and find local businesses to present. Because the Maps doesn't work the same way that organic does. Maps is based on location. So that's what this helps with. The closer someone is, the higher you get ranked. Now, why optimization is important? Well, because if somebody takes a keyword, pops it into Google, we wanna have that particular page of your site show up. So in this circumstance, I typed in orthodontics near me. So their primary page shows up, and then their sub page shows up that specifically talks about orthodontics. So what do you think the patient's gonna click on? Well, they're gonna take it, they're gonna click on orthodontics, and then they find what they're looking for in one click. That way they don't have to go to your home page to go to your services page to go to your orthodontics page. They go straight to your orthodontics page. Keep it really simple for them. Next, Google Business Profile. So it used to be called Google My Business, not anymore, it's called Google Business Profile. This is the Maps section to Google. So the first thing that you wanna do is you wanna claim ownership of your page. How many of you have actually claimed ownership of your page? Really? Has someone done it on your behalf? I thought maybe more hands would have gone up. Claim ownership of it today. Get ownership of your page, so that way you can respond to reviews. You can make announcements on it, right? Like this, this section of Google is getting intuitive, so you have to make sure you claim ownership of it. Next thing you wanna do is you wanna update your profile. So you wanna make sure the name of your practice is correct. Your phone, fax, email, appointment schedule, your hours of operation, your website link. You have to update this information. Services offered, description, everything. Even the year your office opened, you can add it. Now, if you have multiple locations, you can organize your profiles as well from here. So you can just create groups and say like, these are for California, this is for Arizona, or like this is like per, you can separate it per group. To, that way not, not everything is kind of listed as one. After you do Google, you wanna do Bing. Did you know that 30% of the world still uses Bing? Because it's the default browser for PCs. Not everybody knows how to change their default settings or their default search engines. So we wanna do the same thing on Bing to make sure that you're found. So the first thing you have to do is you go to bing.com and you log in. What's cool is that Bing and Microsoft talk to each other. So you can actually log in to Bing through your Google account. So first thing you do is you log in. Then what you do is you wanna sync. So if you set up Google, you log in, and then you sync Google to Bing. So 
Bing's going to basically take all the data off of Google and then put it right on Bing's account. Now, it's not going to be 100% accurate. It's about 95%. So once it's synced, it usually takes about a minute or two. You go to your home page and you edit it, just like you do on your Google page. And you edit every piece of information, hours, images, contact information. You, know, you can even add some social media profiles. And that's all you do. And then you've got a Bing page. And honestly, that takes about three or four minutes. Like It's not complicated to set up. Okay. Now, once that's set up, you want to add conversion tools to your website. So there are lots of different types of conversion tools. There's a click to call now button, a web form, book online, or in this case, a chat bot. Now, there's lots of different types of chat systems. So you have a live chat and you have a chat bot. A live chat requires someone to physically respond. A chat bot is an automated response system. So how the bot works is you basically want to create a bunch of, a bunch of scenarios. So somebody, uh, and the scenarios are based on procedures, right? So if somebody is looking for cosmetic, you have a section of your bot talking about cosmetic. If they're wanting uh, data information about implants, you've got a section of your bot talking about implants. So you can talk about something specific or you can be generic with your statements. Then what you want to do is you want to tie them together. Or sorry, you want to create a story for each one of them. So you talk about cosmetic, here's the info on cosmetic. You talk about implants, here's the info on implants. Then what you want to do is you want to tie them together. So let's just say the first column talks about cosmetic dentistry and at the end it says, would you like to book an appointment for cosmetic? Or would you like to learn about veneers, bonding, or teeth whitening? The patient says, you know what? Tell me about veneers. So the bot says, okay, perfect. Here's the info on veneers. Now at the end, do you want to book an appointment for veneers? Learn about teeth whitening, bonding, or something else? And the bot says, uh, or the, the patient says, you know what? Let's book an appointment. So all the patient does is they say, okay, or the bot says, okay, perfect. Can I have your name, your email, your phone number, and the best time to call? Maybe your primary concern. So then you get an email that looks like this. It says, hey, just letting you know, Brandon's looking for veneers. Here's his contact information and his chat history. Now, most offices will email that patient back and say, hey, you know, got your message. Uh, you, you know, we, when, when can we get you in? But do you remember what the percentage was on the email of when you email a patient back at the beginning of the presentation? I went over it. How, how, what's the percentage that that email is going to go into the patient's spam box? 70%. Most people will email that patient back. Do not email back. Call them. You get that email, pick up the phone, make the call. Have you seen Wolf of Wall Street? Pick up the phone, start dialing. Pick up, like it's not hard. Pick it up, hey, got your message, Brandon. Yeah, we can get you in for veneers. When can you come? It's not complicated. Pick it up, make the phone call. I promise you, you'll book more patients, okay? And this is how the bot functions. So there's two ways that a bot can function typically. The first way, we always prefer this. Here's a, here's a question, here's a series of responses. Okay, this way there's no free text. The second way is a free text option. The problem with free text options is that it leaves room for human error, right? The bots really can't uh, understand spelling or grammar mistakes. So if somebody does make a mistake, the bot's gonna say, I'm sorry, please repeat that. I'm sorry, please repeat that. And it gets annoying and then the patient leaves and then you've lost that person forever. So instead what we do is we give a question, series of answers, all you have to do is select the best one for you, and then it goes down a pathway. Every pathway it goes down, it asks for your contact information. Really simple, right? Good. Next, what we want to do is you want to build your website popularity. Best way to do that is to get found on directories, okay? Lots of different directories. So first thing you want to do is you want to go find the directory, claim the directory, or add your uh, information to it, and you're going to update all this information. So you're going to update your name of your practice, your phone, fax, email, physical address, hours, industry, service, and website link. It's a lot of information. Now, you have to make sure that this information is accurate according to Google. So you remember when we claimed your business profile and we updated that information? Whatever you put there needs to be on the directory. If it's not, Google's going to say, perfect, that backlink, the last item here, doesn't count. How many of you know what a backlink is? It's a link that leads to your website not from Google, but from an alternative source. The more backlinks you have, the more places that lead to your website, the higher you get ranked. But the caveat is that the information needs to be accurate. So if Google's business says Brandon Dentistry, and then on yellow pages it says Brandon Dental, 
Google says, I don't care about your, your, your information. So you don't get any points. No points for yellow pages. So you have to make sure that the information is accurate. And unfortunately, there's hundreds of directories that you can be on. So instead of doing this manually, you're going to work with something called an aggregator. Now, an aggregator basically disseminates information to the internet on your behalf. There are three kinds of aggregators. You've got local aggregators, national aggregators, and industry-specific aggregators. Okay? Now, if you could take a look at this map, you can't be the ones in California on the local aggregators based in New York or Canada. You can't be on those ones. You can be on the industry-specific ones or the national ones. So it is limited kind of on who you can, which aggregators you should be working with. Okay? Now, typically, an aggregator can work with five to as many as 100 or 300 different directories, and they'll just plaster your information that is relevant. So if, let's just say that it's a national directory like Yellow Pages, uh, or, or an aggregator that works with Yellow Pages, they'll just push your information out to Yellow Pages, Yelp, RateMDs, Health Grades, like all these different places, okay? Now, you, it's not just one aggregator that you're working with. You're working with multiple different aggregators, okay? So there's consumer ones that you can work with, Typically, they charge for it, like Yext is one. Yellow Pages is technically an aggregator as well. They do charge for it, right? Or you can work with commercial aggregators through a company like ours, where we work with all the different kinds of aggregators. Some are free, some are paid, but ultimately, you work with a commercial, uh, a commercial company like ours, you get plastered on all the different aggregators that you can be on in one swoop. Makes, it, makes your life a lot easier. Now. The reason why you want to do this is because of links. Everyone has heard of linking. Now there's three kinds of links. You have internal linking. That goes from page to page on your website. Okay? Next is external linking. That goes from your website to an external source. And then you have directory links. That goes from an external source to your website. Okay? So you have to do all three kinds. The kind I was just explaining about is directory linking. Now, you remember that search console I explained earlier that also gives you, all, that gives you a list of all the keywords? That system also gives you a list of all the places that you get found online. So if you don't have access to Google Search Console, go out and go get it today. It's a free system that you link into your website. It takes about five minutes to set up, and it starts accumulating data. And so the linking piece here tells you how many links that you have that are on your site, that link to your site, and that you link to all, uh, alternative sources. Next, website accessibility. How many of you, by show of hands, know what accessibility is? Three people. OK. Website accessibility. This is for people with disabilities so they can use and engage with your website. So we can make sure, or the accessibility feature can make sure, that the website is read to you. So if you, you have you know, a, a vision impairment, like let's just say you're, you're blind, the website can be read to you, which is actually pretty cool. Increase the text size if you, again, have vision impairment. Uh, change the font size as well, or change the font. So if you don't like the cursive, like if, if the patient can't read the, the cursive writing, you, you can have that font changed into something else, which is pretty, pretty cool. Change the color scheme if you're colorblind, right? You can have that, uh, the entire website changed in a different color, which is pretty neat. And then you can change the cursor size. So for people who might have uh, attention deficit disorder, you can make sure that the, the, the cursor size can change, or there can be a follow line to make sure that they're only paying attention to specific lines on the website. Now, the benefits of this, it helps people with disabilities. But the two other big side benefits is one is it helps patients stay on your website longer because they're playing with it. Even people with not, with, don't have disabilities, you take this. Have any of you ever played with this before on a site? It's actually, it's, it's pretty cool because like the font size of this can get so much bigger and like people will just like screw around with this. And the longer they stay on your site, the, the higher you get ranked. Okay? It's one of the top 20 things that Google looks at. How long is someone staying on your site? That's why social media is like ranked always number one for everything. Because people are staying on it. And then technologically advanced. So one of the top 20 things that Google looks at is how technologically advanced is your site? Is it mobile friendly? Uh, does it format correctly? Is it properly secure? Does it load quickly? And another one would be, is it technologically advanced through accessibility features? Okay, so you want to enable something like this on your site. Next, you want to ask for reviews. How many of you ask for reviews from your existing patients? Oh, good. I like that. Okay, now there's four ways to generate reviews. The first and best way is through a survey. This way you're actually getting feedback from patients. 
So after the appointment's done, you send the patient a survey. Survey gets sent to the patient through text or email, something like that. Patient gets it, clicks on it, goes back to your website. Patient completes the survey. It's a series of questions, you know, rank this out of a scale of one to 10. Now the cool thing about surveys, depending on, on how technologically advanced they are, they can direct patients to a specific place based on the rank that they gave you. So if they gave you a lower rank, you just say, thanks, have a great day. But if they give you a higher rank, it says, hey, would you mind leaving us a review? This way it keeps any negative comments offline. Next way is through a sign in the waiting room. Simple sign with a QR code saying, hey, would you mind leaving us a review? Generates two, three reviews every single month like clockwork. Next is you can ask for it during the appointment. This way is a little bit iffy. Imagine you're dealing with a patient, you lean them back in the chair, it's, uh, I know I'm working on your crown, but can you give me a five-star review? It's like they're gonna be, they're gonna feel pretty awkward if they, you know, no, I'm not gonna do it. Give it to me, right? Like, pick and choose your moments. Or like, here's a $5,000 bill, can I have five stars? Right, pick and choose your moments. And next is in an email post appointment. This way is not overly recommended because I send you an email, it says, hey, you know what, uh, 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 it was a pleasure speaking with you, Brandon. Would you mind leaving me a five-star review on Google? The issue is that you don't know what Brandon's gonna say about you after he leaves your office. You know what, I had the worst experience at your office and I'm gonna leave you zero stars and I'm gonna leave it under a fake name, you'll never know it's me. So if you are going to send an email, just send them a survey link instead. The survey will automate that process for you. So if they have anything bad, it'll stay off your site, it'll stay offline. And you do this because everyone's influenced by reviews. Personally, I don't go to a steakhouse unless it has a 4.5 rating. So know your, know your standards, right? Now, who can leave reviews? This is a fun question. How many of you have left a review on yourself? One person. Why don't you go online right now and go give yourself five stars? Why would you not? Yelp, Yellow Pages, Google, Facebook, rate MDs, health grades, rate a biz, find a dentist. That's like eight five-star reviews you can get by yourself. Now I'm sure all of you have friends or family members that can also leave you a review. You know, eight times two, three, four. It's like, it's like 100 reviews you can get today. Now don't do that today because it's gonna look incredibly fake. So you kind of have to go after one to two people every couple of days or once a week. By the end of the year, you'll have 100 reviews. Very, very simple. So, there's multiple people that can leave reviews. First, your patients, obviously. Your staff can leave reviews, what it's like working with you. Your vendors can leave reviews. I'm sure all of you may have bought something today. Go back to them, give them your Google page and say, can you, would you mind leaving me a review? You know, I just spent $40,000. Of course they're gonna do it. Like, why would they not, right? <laughs> They'll probably get all their, all their staff to do it too. And then yes, even you, you can leave a review about yourself. Now the thing about reviews is that Google indexes the content in the review. So if the patient writes, uh, well, Brand wow, Brandon had a really great team of dentists. Uh, you know, they helped with my child's wisdom teeth. You know, if you need a dentist for your child, you need to call him in San Jose. Next time somebody types in child dentist in San Jose for wisdom teeth, that review is gonna help you show up number one. Very important. And the response you give to that is also indexed. So if I go online and say, hey, thanks, Google doesn't care, but if I go online and say, thanks so much for the review, you know, positive or negative, we wanna make sure everyone has a great experience with their child and wisdom teeth, give us a call if you need you know, help with your pediatric needs in the future. Lots of great content in there, okay? So respond to your reviews. Next is Google Ads. Anybody here doing Google Ads? A few of you? Okay. So, First, what you want to do, instead of just like randomly creating a Google Ads account, you want to sync Google, Ad, or Google Analytics with Google Ads. So Google Analytics is basically a free system, similar to Search Console, that gives you access to tons of data. So all you have to do, Google unfortunately doesn't do this automatically, you link the two systems together. You link Analytics with Google Ads. This way, Analytics is going to talk to Ads and give you tons more data. So, if I didn't do that, I'd basically be playing a guessing game. What time of day should I advertise? What keywords should I do? What content should I write about? Instead, analytics, the organic data that Google gives, is going to tell Google Ads, hey, advertise at these times of day. Use these keywords, write about this content. Pretty simple. So the first thing that you have to fine tune this with is what procedures do you want the data to be about? 
Okay? So you don't want to just write about everything. Otherwise, if you let Google Analytics and Google Ads just kind of advertise, they're, they're going to advertise for everything. And you don't want that, right? They're all advertised for the word the. Like, <laughs> the hell? No one's going to type that in to find a dentist. So you want to tell it, only advertise for these specific procedures. I only want to see these keywords, this content. Then what you want to do is you want to tell it what keywords to promote for. Now, there's three kinds of keywords. You've got broad, exact, and negative. So a broad match keyword is one or two words that match a sentence. A negative, or a, a, an exact keyword is a phrase that someone types in. And a negative keyword is something you do not want to show up for. Okay, you don't want to show up for it. So Google's gonna say, all right, you want root canals? Here's a thousand keywords for root canals. So then you've got to go through and say, yes, no, yes, no, negative broad, negative broad. You got to go through all of them and figure it out. Now, Google doesn't just let you do that once. So people search differently at different points a year using different data. So they're going to make you do that every couple of months. Not make you, but like they'll give you a bunch of new keywords every couple of months and say, hey, or it might be every couple of weeks depending on your budget. Hey, here's some new keywords we found. You know, please go through them. Let us know which one you want to show up for. Do you want to add these, yes or no? After you've done procedures and, and keywords, now you've got to pick the time of day. Does anybody know the best time of day to advertise for Google Ads? Anybody? Okay, best time of day to promote for Google Ads? All the time, <laughs> like literally. You know, I'm a parent, I've got two kids. What time do you think that I talk to my wife about you know, things to do for our kids? Evenings, when they're asleep. Weekends, when they're at grandma's. So you're gonna advertise not just during the time that you're open, but every other time that you're not open. Now, Historically, there's zero conversion, like next to zero conversions that happen between 11 o'clock at night until 6 a.m. So you're actually gonna advertise from six in the morning until 11 at night, Monday through Sunday, all the time. And you just call the lead when, the, when you come back in the next day if you did get any over the weekend, okay? Uh, now, to back up for one second, you're not gonna actually advertise for 17 hours a day. That's insane. You'd have to have like a multi-million dollar budget, okay? Google would not do that. So what they're going to do based on your budget is talk to analytics and say, all right, somebody's online Googling for implants, get the ad up now. And so they'll pick times throughout the day that you'll advertise for. Might only be a few minutes, okay? But ultimately you're gonna be advertising at the right time of day. Then you've got, okay, then you've got uh, your content. So what should be in the ad? Someone types in implants or cosmetic dentistry or teeth whitening, it's six o'clock on a Saturday, your ad pops up, what's the ad gonna say? It could say any number of things. Most people, what they're gonna do, teeth whitening, call today. Is that gonna get you patience? Probably not. How about starting a new job? Consider teeth whitening. Don't have time for teeth whitening? You know, try our take home teeth whitening kits, right? Um, do you, do you, do you uh, you know, you're getting married, prom coming up? You know, try teeth whitening. You know, how about this one? Coffee stains, yellow brown teeth, we can help. It's not just about the service, it's about the emotion. How are you going to get that person, oh, I've got, you know what, I'm getting married. I'm gonna click on that. You know, I, I have yellow teeth, I'm gonna click on that. Okay, get them, get the emotion behind it. And you think about this from all different ads, from your implants, emergencies, everything, okay? Then you've got to factor in your budget. How much are you gonna spend? Let's say within three miles of your office, there's 50 dentists promoting for, for teeth whitening. Let's say they're on average they're spending 600 bucks. You have to go in and spend 700 bucks. You gotta spend 10 to 20% more than the average. You don't have to spend the most, just more than the average. Now you also have to consider times of day. You also have to consider uh, 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 other services that you're promoting for. So it's not just teeth whitening that you're doing. You want root canals, you want emergencies, you want pediatrics, you want general and, and family dentistry. So you've gotta make sure that you've got an appropriate budget for each one of these services to make sure you're advertising at the right times of day for the right keywords, okay? Anything you spend, you should get two to eight times in return. Now, our best performing office is getting 23 times in return. Imagine putting in a dollar and getting 23 bucks back. <laughs> like, that's insane, okay? So you've gotta make sure that you link it, funnel it, and then review it constantly, okay? Next, Facebook and Instagram. I say Facebook and Instagram, Take it with a grain of salt, I mean social media in general. Usually you wanna start with Facebook and Instagram because they're the ones that everyone knows. First thing that you wanna get done is you wanna update your profile. So 
Updating your profile means updating your, your, your logo, updating your cover picture, your contact information, your description, everything. After that, you want to set up the automated responses. So Facebook has a very simple uh, chat system. It just says, hey, welcome to our page. Here's our hours and our contact information. Next thing you want to do is you want to set up your pixel. So I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Pixel before, but it's basically an analytic system for social media. It tracks demographic information, age, gender, marital status, kids, jobs, stuff like that. So then what you're going to do is you're going to look at that and you say, hey, wow, I get a lot of traffic about kids. What do you think I'm going to be writing about on social media? About kids, right? You get a lot of traffic for people with parents? Sure, you're going to write about it. Then you're going to engage with them. So if they comment, you reply. If they share a post, you share one of theirs. If they like a post, like one of theirs. Okay. Now these last three items are cyclical. So you can't just like look at the data once and start creating posts about that because the data changes. So you want to make sure you're looking at the pixel, creating the post, engaging. Looking at the pixel, creating the post, and engaging. Okay. After that, you want to start advertising on, on Facebook. So you advertise on Facebook and Instagram through a company called Meta. I'm sure all of you have heard of Meta at some point over the last year. Basically, it's a way to compete. It's Facebook's way of competing with Google Ads. So the first thing you want to do is you want to build your audiences. And so that pixel data that I was explaining earlier, age, gender, marital status, and whatnot, you basically group it together and you build audience groups. This this one is for men, this audience group is for women. This is for people under 30, over 30, with children, without children. And then what you do is you build posts for each audience group. So this way I can tailor the ads specifically to people without children. I can tailor the ads to people with children. So you can create multiple different ads for each group. This way you can do what's called an A-B test, which ad performs better. Then what you want to do is you want to set up the time frame, frequency, and radius. So time frame, when do you want the ads to appear, frequency, how often, how big of a radius, that will ultimately determine how much you spend. If the budget is too much, then you have to adjust the time frame, frequency, or budget. And next is promote and engage. Just like you would on your standard Facebook profile posts. If they comment, you reply. If they share, you share back. What's cool about these ones is that if somebody likes or engages with the post, you can invite them to like your page. So not only will this help generate patients, it's also going to help generate followers for you. And you can advertise on all different kinds of social media too. So TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, whatever you guys want. You can, you can advertise on anything. Next, you want to review and modify. So every system I just explained does something different. So your website traffic is going to tell you where people are coming from, how people are finding you, what pages they, they came from, what pages they landed to. Google Analytics is going to tell you keywords people have typed in and times of day they're searching. Facebook Analytics is going to track demographic information like age, gender, marital status, kids and job and stuff like that. So what you do is you take one system to improve the other. Unfortunately, not one system has all the data. So if I go to Google and I say, Google, give me the data, it's going to say, wow, you get a lot of traffic at 8 o'clock at night for implants. So what do you think I'm going to write on Facebook? About implants at what time? 8 o'clock at night. And what kind of data does Facebook give me? Demographic information. So what am I going to do on my website? I'm going to change the imagery to coincide with that demographic. So if more women engage with implant data, then I'm going to change the imagery on the implant page to coincide with women. Pretty simple, right? But you have to do this on a consistent basis, so you can't just do it once. You have to do it all the time. Now. Once you have all the digital stuff, you can go beyond digital. And there is a lot of options beyond digital. You got printed flyers, which I'm sure all of you might have tried. You got radio campaigns, buses, billboards, movie theater advertising. You can advertise at the beginning of a movie, which is pretty cool. Community sponsorships, right? Business partnerships with other offices or similar minded offices that target the same type of uh, uh, traffic. Cosmetic dentists, as an example, have a partnership with tanning salons. You go into the tanning salon, you see an ad saying, hey, you know, whiten your teeth with, you know, brand and dentistry, right? And seminars, hosting seminars in like retirement homes or for, for sports groups. How many of you have ever gone into a AAA sports team for kids and talked about mouth guards? You know, these AAA sports groups have like, you know, 300 kids ranging in age from like 8 to 18. Tons of super elite kids will come to your office just to get a mouth guard and you're going to get tons of patients doing something like that. Now, some additional ideas, packages for colleagues. 
right? You could, you could, you know, if you want to take on, let's say, more implant cases, or if you're an orthodontist wanting to take on more Invisalign or whatever it might be, send packages to your colleagues and ask for referrals, right? Give them gifts, right? Bribe them a little bit, right? Presents for kids. Here's an idea. How many of you deal with kids? Holidays coming up. Get a Christmas tree or a menorah or whatever, whatever you might believe in, put it in your lobby, go to the dollar store, get a bunch of presents, wrap them, put them under the tree. And tell, them to, tell every kid they can take one present and they can't open it until Christmas. You will get so much loyalty from that family, they will refer everybody they have. Nobody gets a present from their dentist. And what's really cool is that you can actually get custom wrapping paper for these presents. They're only three or four bucks at the dollar store, but to get a ridiculous amount of loyalty from that patient, they will never leave you. Next, plans for businesses. So what you could do is you could go into a larger corporation and set up your own plan with their staff. So if you've got like a school, a university, or, or, or you know, a larger corporation, car dealership, whatever it is, go in and say, we'll give you discounts if you pay us a specific amount. So why would you not do that, right? And then partnerships with sports teams, that's what I mentioned with going into the AAA sports teams. Like tons of opportunity, okay? It doesn't just have to be digital. There's lots you can do. Just how focused are you to get it done? Next, we want to add images. So how many of you have ever done custom images before? Have a photographer or videographer in your office? Three, three, four people, okay? So what you want to do, add your logo, right, to your website. You want to add headshots to your staff. You want to add the operatory pictures. But what's missing from here? Your patience. Nobody gives a crap if you've got like a nice office. What matters is if a patient is sitting in that chair and you're smiling helping them, okay? Put patients in your pictures. That's how you're gonna get more conversions, I promise you. Especially from families. If you want more family patients or if you want implants, you know, put some patients in there, okay? Real patients, not stock. Stock does work if you're trying to explain what an inlay or an onlay is. Like, it's hard to explain that with a real patient photo. <laughs> Right? So you can use stock for certain things. Okay? So types uh, that, will, that are going to help. Get, get families, get kids in there. Get the procedures in there. And pictures and videos of your office. So the videos work. Get a walkthrough of your office. It'll look really, really cool. You know, I did a, a drone video for someone where we droned their entire office. <laughs> it was pretty cool. And then flew out of their office and up. Uh, where are you going to use your images? other than your website? Well, you're gonna use them on Google. You're gonna use them on Bing, social media, printed flyers and emailed newsletters. Same images, multiple places, that's how you create a brand. It's an image people can recognize. My brand is my white jacket. I'm actually not a doctor, but I look like one, right? Now when you see me walking around, how many other people here are wearing white coats? Nobody. Right? That's our brand. What do you want to be known for? Okay? You don't have to update them all the time. Every two years, update your pictures. It doesn't have to be frequent. Okay? Next, we want to combine marketing efforts. So, email and social media typically go hand in hand. Whatever you send an email to your patients, copy the same message, put it on social media. Don't reinvent the wheel. Just repurpose the content. Next is creative versus general. That's what I was talking about with the pictures. You can use a general brand when you're explaining what an implant is or what, uh, what a veneer is. You can use stock photos for stuff like that, but you need to combine with, creative, with your own creative brand. What do you want to be known for? Next is blogging and search engine optimization. They go hand in hand. You can create a blog, but unless you optimize it, Google's gonna know, have no idea what that content is. Then print marketing with Google and Facebook. Print marketing does work, but understand the turnaround is about one in a thousand. So you send out a thousand pieces, I'll get one lead. But if I hammered three miles around your office with a Facebook campaign, same three miles with a Google campaign, and then hammered that with a print campaign, that print campaign is now going to perform three times better. The reason being, the person gets the flyer, they're like, oh, that's cool. A week later, they're going to type in dentist near me, and then you have a Google ad pop up. Click on it, eh, no thanks. Then they're gonna go to social media and then you have a social media ad pop up. Hey, I've seen that name before. Click. That's why the conversions happen more. Okay, so you have to do all these things together. 
personal versus uh, stock photo and video. So you want to, oops, whoa, 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 chill. Sorry, <laughs> my clicker just went nuts. Uh, and then office, uh, out of office marketing. So that's like billboards, buses, benches, things like that. You want to do all these things after you get the digital stuff in place, okay? Next, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, we're gonna hire a professional. So you could do all this stuff yourself, but it would take a lot of time to do. So instead of doing it yourself, you wanna hire someone. And everything that they should be doing is updating content, images, colors, fonts, keywords, fix errors on directories, find new directories, renew domains, security licenses, attract media, write blogs, manage social media, print ads, and more. That's what a marketing company should do. The benefit of working with Dr. Marketing is that we do all this with dental expertise, which means we are HIPAA and WCAG compliant. WCAG is like uh, accessibility guidelines, okay? We know the content behind the procedures and we know how to explain it in a way that's not gonna get you in trouble or sued, okay? Now, common marketing mistakes. There are lots, I bullet point form them for us so we can go through them quickly. Incorrect phrasing, do not use the word guarantee, love, best, or state of the art in anything that you do, okay? Testimonials and reviews. Do not place written testimonial on your website. It's treated as a statement of fact that you publicly endorse, but you don't know if that person actually wrote it. Video testimonial is preferred. Always respond to reviews, even if they're negative. Just be unbiased. Thanks a bunch for the review. You know, we do want to try our best. Please give us a call and let us know how we can help. Do not address them by name and do not throw them under the bus. That's how you get sued for HIPAA compliance, okay? Uh, incentives, do not give away money to earn reviews or referrals. Do not give away toothbrushes, gift cards, cash, none of that stuff, okay? Association and college guidelines, don't list any study groups you're part of, continuing education courses you take, or positions you hold at an association. Contact information, don't call yourself the supreme dental ruler, okay? If you're a dentist, call yourself a dentist. If you're a peds, call yourself peds, okay? or use a, any sort of a DDS, DMD, whatever your designation is. The reason I say that is because someone in Utah that I, I started servicing a few years ago, his name or his, his title was Supreme Dental Ruler. Do not do that, okay? Multiple websites for the same practice. Again, don't do that, that's how you get blacklisted uh, by Google. Directory mistakes, fix the problems because it costs you business and ranking points. Marketing, promoting for services you don't offer, Obviously, you don't want to do that. Plagiarism, uh, improper explanations, right? Pretty standard stuff. And then marketing budget, right? If your marketing budget's too low, you're not going to get the results you need. If it's too high, you're overspending on basic services. What should your marketing budget be? Anybody know? Anybody want to take a guess how much they need to be spending percentage of their business? Nobody wants to take a guess? How much you say? 5%? 10%? Four, it's pretty good. Technically, you could spend 100% of your budget if you wanted to, right? But the average is between one and four, and I'm gonna explain why. Now, website designs, typically, from an average marketing company, will be, be between one to 10 grand, depending on if it's a template or a custom website. Custom emails, that's the HIPAA compliance, will be between 10 to $100 a month, depending on the amount of space and security features involved. Chatbot systems are between 50 to 300 a month. Directory listing management, same 50 to 300 a month. That depends on, or, or, sorry, that's fixing the problems, getting you found in new places. Review Booster is the custom survey that I mentioned that can redirect patients to the correct, or to, to Google to leave you a review if it's a positive survey. Uh, search engine optimization. This is usually between 250 to 500 from the average provider, depending on the, uh, th this depends on if if you're doing like static or dynamic or how many pages you have, that sort of thing. Social media, this depends on the number of posts and then platform that you ultimately want to target. And then ads. So ads budget usually is between 15 and 25%. So if you're spending 1,000, the average marketing company will spend between, or it will charge between 150 to $250 to manage your 1,000. The reason it's a percentage because the more you spend, the more work is involved. So Google doesn't just say, hey, you know, you set it up, see it forever. It doesn't work like that, okay? Google's gonna give us, as marketing companies, they're going to give us an optimization score. And if your optimization score score is below a certain amount, we risk losing our partnership, 
I'm not about that. So we have to continually review it. The more you spend, the more we have to review, okay? Annually, you should be spending between one and 4% of your gross sales, okay? Now you could be spending more, six to 10%, if you just hired an associate, built out a new operatory, or you know, you're booked until tomorrow. You could be spending 100% if you're a brand new office, but usually it's between one and 4%. That depends on the number of patients and the number of operatories, it has to correlate. If you've got six operatories and 500 active patients, you're gonna be spending a lot more than 4% to get that up, okay? Now, is your marketing working? Here's a cool few tips and tricks for you. Website design, look at your website on all device sizes. Make sure that it formats correctly, okay? You can do this, just use your phone, scroll through, use your tablet, scroll through. Search engine optimization, this one's a pretty cool one, so I don't know if you guys wanna write this one down. How many of you are paying for optimization from your marketing company? or at some point have paid for it? None of you, one person, really? Okay, that's impressive, only one person. So what you can do is you right click on any page of your website and you click view page source. When you click view page source, you get a system that looks like this. This is the code of your site. You basically take this, you pop it in, or you take this and you pop out uh, the control F feature, which is a master find, and you look for things like title and description. So that are two, those are two of the items that Google looks at. So you can actually see if the person you're paying for optimization is actually doing their job. Next is social media and blogging. Look at the dates, look at the content, make sure that it's being posted consistently, make sure that the brand is there, make sure that the content makes sense, right? Use the image or use, the, use your logo in the images, that sort of thing. Ad spend. So, Typical patients will cost between 150 to 250 to generate. The reason for that fluctuation is based on the procedure you want to promote for. Emergency patients want to be seen immediately so they're less expensive. Aesthetic patients like veneers, crown and bridge, implants, they're more expensive, okay? Also the conversion is less likely to happen with an aesthetic patient, understand that, okay? So unless you're prepared to spend, like the average closing percentage for an aesthetic patient is 15% which means you're gonna get 100 leads, you're gonna close 15 of them. That's a lot of rejection. Now, your staff plays such a pivotal role in this as well, okay? So if your staff pick up the phone and say the wrong thing, it affects the closing percentage, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, just a little bit about Dr. Marketing, full service marketing agency. We specialize only in working with dental offices, no term contracts, save the average office 36 hours a month, we like to take our time, be easy to understand, and offer effective service. And we've got partnerships with Google, Facebook, GoDaddy, Microsoft, and Constant Contact. So if these billion dollar companies trust us, I think you should too. Now in terms of services, we offer everything. Everything I just went over. We even do this cool thing where we advertise on dating sites for cosmetic dentists. It works tremendous. Like, hey, uh, not getting any matches? You know, call us. It works amazing on the conversion. Now I did put together some case studies in case you wanna take a look at this from other offices, different types of offices, different locations, what they're doing is different, what their budgets are different, how, how much they're getting is different. I don't know if you can really read this, I know the content is really small. But basically the last guy on the end, he's based in Seattle, spends about seven grand. I think he just upped his budget, his budget's now 12 because he just hired a new associate. But he's, he generated last year $1.1 $1 million in new business. His budget with us was only 80,000. That's a lot of turnaround. And as a pro tip, start basic. Things like optimization, Google ads, Facebook, email marketing, print, Instagram, it should all take a back seat. Understand your analytics before you take that step into marketing. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be up here. I've also got a couple flyers in case you want to come and grab one, okay? All right, thanks everyone.